Hello, everyone. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for another of our trademark webinars. Uh, we're going to get started in just a couple of minutes, but uh, as we always do, we're going to begin with a couple of housekeeping tips uh, to make sure that everyone is on the same page uh, before we get going. Uh, so I know it's going to it's a question that's going to be asked because someone's going to ask it because everybody does it every single webinar. Is this being recorded? And the answer is yes, this session is being recorded. It'll be posted to the USPTO website within about three to four weeks. We try to turn it around as quickly as possible. So you will have access to it uh, in three weeks to a month, somewhere around there. Uh, the slides have already been made available to you, uh, but if you didn't get a chance to download those, uh, don't worry, they'll be available uh, after the presentation as well. Uh, the same thing is true with captioning. If you happen to, happen to need captioning today, that is available as it is for all of our USPTO events. And the way that you access captioning on a live stream is you go up into the top right hand corner of the live stream window, and there you'll see a couple of icons, one of which is the events post tab. And if you click on that, it looks kind of like a little filing cabinet with a little triangular play symbol on it. If you click on that, you're gonna it'll open up and show you various posts. There you'll see a link to the captioning that is available. You'll also uh, see the email addresses that you might want to use today. Uh, one of them is tmfeedback at uspto.gov. That is the way that you contact us if you have a question that you want to ask. I know that the chat is currently available in live stream, uh, but it's gonna go away in about 10 to 15 minutes. Minutes, and the chat is really only there right now uh, for you to let us know if you're having any audio issues. Um, so Amy does not have access to the live stream chat. So if you ask her a question through live stream chat, she is not going to see it. She's not going to be able to answer it. So the way that you contact us and let Amy know that you have a question is to email tmfeedback at uspto.gov. And you can always access that email address and see it uh, throughout the presentation today by clicking on that post tab. Now, the great thing about live stream is that it is kind of like a little DVR. Uh, so if you have to pause and step away for a minute, uh, you can do that. You can pause, you can fast forward, you can rewind. But just keep in mind uh, that when the session ends at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, that means that the feed is over. So you won't be able to uh, be able to hang out and, and watch after that time period. So if you have any technical issues uh, after the chat goes away on live stream, you can always email virtual events at uspto.gov. And we have a really great tech team here, uh, and they'll be able to hopefully troubleshoot any audio issues that you might have. All right, well, we are going to get started. Uh, so uh, allow me to introduce you to Amy Cotton. She's the Deputy Commissioner for Trademark Examination Policy. And in this role, she oversees the offices of Trademark Policy, petitions and ID class, as well as the Trademark Assistance Center, the Office of Trademark Quality Review and Training, the Trademark Law Library, Customer Experience, and Trademark Outreach. She joined the USPTO in 1998 as a trademark examining attorney, and then moved to the Office of Policy and International Affairs in 2001, where she served as Senior Counsel for Trademarks since 2003, providing domestic and international policy advice to the USPTO and the US government agencies, and technical assistance to the global trademark offices. For nearly 20 years, Ms. Cotton has led the U.S. delegation to the World Intellectual Property Organization on trademark matters, including negotiations to conclude the Singapore Treaty on the Law of Trademarks and the Geneva Act of the Lisbon Agreement for the International Registration of Appellations of Origin and Geographical Indications. Prior to joining the USPTO, Ms. Cotton served as External Affairs Counsel at the American Intellectual Property Law Association. She's a member of the Virginia Bar and received her Juris Doctorate from, from Indiana University, Bloomington, and her Bachelor of Arts from the University of Virginia. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Amy Cotton taking you through some trademark registration protection initiatives. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Jason. Um, we, I'm here to talk to you about one of uh, the five initiatives of the trademarks organization within the USPTO. We certainly, as you know, are dealing with a, an enormous uh, trademark application filing surge. That's our first uh, priority. We're dealing with the implementation of the Trademark Modernization Act. Um, we're working on IT modernization, and of course, we're also working on uh, trade, evolving our organization to better deal with uh, uh, these uh, waves of applications and, and all the different initiatives that we want to pursue. Um, but our, our fifth initiative is register protection. It has become extremely important uh, to make sure that we are protecting the integrity of the trademark register. And I wanted to take you through uh, the work that we've been doing on that. We've actually been working on this for over 10 years. So if you go back to 2009 in In Re Bose, that uh, decision came out of the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. 
it made it more difficult to prove that a false statement of use should be considered fraud, if you recall. Um, finding a fraud, of course, voids that tainted class in the application of the registration, but it really established a clear sanction, and that's cancellation uh, of the affected goods and services in that class when you make a false claim of use in a maintenance submission. Now, looking back, we were concerned at that time uh, in 2009 that the impact of the case would be that we would see more false claims of use in maintenance submissions and then in applications. Uh, so in 2010, the USPTO convened a roundtable in conjunction with George Washington University called the Future of the Use-Based Register. And we wanted to see if stakeholders shared our concern about the potential impact of that case, and they clearly did. Uh, so between the USPTO and the stakeholders, we came up with a variety of different suggestions for changes that we could make to the system to increase the duty of care of our applicants and disincentivize inaccurate statements. Now, stakeholders rightly indicated a significant concern that changes to address, you know, bad faith behavior might make it harder for good faith filers to use the system. So we were slow and deliberate as we started poking around at this issue. So in 2012, we instituted um, a provision. We wanted to measure the volume of the inaccurate claims of use <clears throat> that we were seeing in Section 8 or 71 declaration filings. We established that proof of use audit pilot program. Now, we made that program permanent in 2017, and that's the first of the events on our timeline uh, on the slides. Do we have the slides up? There we go. There we go. So now, as you see on our timeline, um, the post-registration audit program was made uh, made permanent in 2017, but of course our efforts dated back all the way to 2010 and 2012, but I couldn't fit that on the slide. Uh, the audit program had limited effect, uh, in my view, because we did not originally impose a sanction for filing false claims of use other than uh, just letting the goods and services go uh, a deletion at that point. Now. Starting about 2018, 2019, we started seeing an increase, not just in these false claims of use that prompted the audit program, but in other things. We started seeing filings that include fake names, um, fake addresses, fake specimens of use, and suspicious attorney behavior. So we were seeing behavior that appeared designed to circumvent our rules of practice, our rules of representation, professional conduct, and our website terms of use. So our slow and conservative start to protecting the register from false claims of use back in 2012, it needed to accelerate and expand to, to address these other types of behavior. And you see that acceleration in this timeline. In 2019, USPTO increased the scrutiny of specimens of use. Uh, we also at that time uh, stood up a special task force responsible for investigating improper behavior and scams. 2019, we implemented the U.S. Council Rule, the rule that, that is the practice of most other countries, uh, where we require foreign domiciliaries to be represented by a U.S. licensed attorney. 2019 also, we were busy in 2019, we implemented phase one of the USPTO.gov account login requirements that allow us to better track filing behaviors. But that all wasn't enough. Uh, the filing numbers were increasing and so too were suspicious filings. So, in 2020, um, we shifted to a more aggressive mindset. We started thinking like a brand owner dealing with anti-counterfeiters, and we started focusing on sanctions. How can we sanction uh, the behavior that we don't want to see? In 2012, I'm sorry, 2021, we implemented a deletion fee uh, for any goods or services deleted in the context of an examination of the maintenance filing, including uh, as to the audit proceedings. 2021, we started issuing administrative sanctions against actors who are intentionally violating U.S. rules of practice, representation, or, or our terms of use of our website. And also in 2021, as you know, we're now preparing <clears throat> to implement the provisions of the Trademark Modernization Act, which is, of course, the latest in a series of initiatives and tools that are all designed to increase the accuracy of submissions and the resulting integrity of the U.S. Trademark Register. But I'm going to tell you about each one of these initiatives. So. As I said, in uh, 2012, we implemented the post-registration audit uh, program, and it was to test the claims of use, the accuracy of the claims of use in a Section 8 or 71 declaration. So as you know, uh, registration may be audited if it meets two requirements. Uh, a Section 8 or 71 declaration is filed, 
and the registration includes at least either one class with four or more goods or services or two classes with two or more goods or services. Now, as you know, the process is the office action will invite the registrant to provide proof of use for two additional goods and services per class. If the registrant does not either provide proof of use for the queried goods and services or delete those queried goods and services, then the examiner will issue a second action and request more proof of use on additional goods and services in that same class. If the registrant uh, ends up having to delete the queried goods and services, the registrant must pay a deletion fee of $250 per class in response to that office action. So this deletion fee, keep in mind, is a, is a feature of both the audit program and regular post-registration examination. More generally, we introduced the fee in 2021. It is a sanction for a false claim of use. Anytime you delete in the context of a maintenance examination, you will have to pay that fee. And if you fail to pay it, you could lose the entire registration, not just the query goods and services. How do you avoid the penalty? Keep your registration accurate as to those goods and services for which the mark remains in use. Now, why did we implement this deletion fee? Well, since 2017, uh, we've issued 17,218 office actions. The deletion feat has remained that deletion rate, sorry, delete, deletion rate has remained pretty steady since uh, since the inception of the program in 2012. Really, we're right about 50% deletion rate. Um, there are only really slight deviations uh, amongst uh, over time and between a Section 1A registrant and a 44 or 66 registrant. There's not much much daylight between them. Uh, What's troubling to me, though, is that 82% of the registrants involved in these audits who have been required to delete goods and services um, or have had their entire registrations, they had attorneys. Attorneys were representing these registrants where deletion was occurring. 50% of the cases are deletions, and 82% of the registrants were represented. So these attorneys are responsible for filing maintenance documents that claimed use that was not substantiated when queried in the audit program. So perhaps maybe we've cleaned up the registrations that were audited, but the audit program alone was not incentivizing accuracy more broadly. We hope that the deletion fee will. Uh, and I tell you, it's, it's a bit too early to tell whether it's changing maintenance filing behavior. Uh, it's gonna take a while for those actions, uh, response to office actions where we required the deletion fee to come in uh, to, to see the behavior and see the effects. But anecdotally, our examiners are seeing more deletions at the filing uh, of the, the Section 8s and 71s and, and slightly fewer deletions in the context of the examination of the declaration. So we're, when we have more numbers to share on that, we certainly will do so. Now, the audit program and the deletion fee, those are aimed at maintenance filings. In 2019, we wanted to increase the scrutiny in parallel than with uh, claims of use in applications. Um, now, one suggestion that we routinely hear when we, uh, the issue of fake claims of use comes up is that we should just simply change our rules and require one specimen of use for each good or services identified in the application rather than just the existing rule which requires one specimen for each class. Clearly, we did not implement that suggestion in the audit program for maintenance filings. It's a huge lift for everybody. It's a huge lift for applicants, attorneys, and examining attorneys. So, now, the audit program solves this by randomly selecting filings for audit and then slowly ramping up the requirements for additional proof of use for multiple goods and services in the audited class if the registrant can't provide appropriate proof of use. So what's the analog in examination? Well, uh, TMEP 904.01, perhaps, uh, it's the disparate goods inquiry that's set out in uh, TMEP 904.01. So examining attorneys have the discretion to require additional specimens of use for a class when the range of items is wide or contains unrelated articles. Now, we have heard calls, for instance, from the Office of the Inspector General of the Department of Commerce in a recent report that we should issue more guidance that defines what we mean by wide range of items or unrelated articles. And presumably the idea is that we should be encouraging examiners to use this, this, this discretion more. Um, now, we have to consider, though, that when we give the examining attorneys discretion to take an action, it certainly impinges on that discretion when we tightly prescribe the conditions under which they can exercise it. Those conditions start making it look more mandatory, right? Um, and if the examiners were to start requiring additional specimens for the long IDs in all cases, all applicants will be impacted, not just the bad faith ones. 
So we're certainly um, trying to avoid uh, impacting those good faith actors. Uh, and so we issued guidance in 2019 to establish a policy that a fake, which is a digitally altered, creative, or mocked up specimen, uh, it creates an inference that, that the mark was not in actual use in commerce. Now, while this might seem obvious, if there's a fake spec, then maybe it's probably not in use in commerce. Uh, it was a significant policy shift for us uh, because it allows then uh, evidence of non-use to be considered in examination. Um, while we had, uh, let's see, let me go to the next one. While we had examination guidance dating back to 2014 on digitally created specimens, it was more focused on making sure applicants provided us with the right kind of specimen, not whether they were trying to fool us. Our guidance emphasized requiring substitute specimens that were better showed the mark as it is in use in commerce in situations where the original specimen appeared digitally created or mocked up. In 2018-2019, we started seeing clearly fake images. And because we were allowing substitute specimens to overcome every specimen refusal, we started seeing better fakes. Our 2019 guidance told examiners to refuse registration when an image was clearly fake and that they should then follow up with a request for information to make the applicant prove that the mark was in actual use. In the 2019 version, we did not allow the applicant to respond to the refusal with substitute specimens or to amend to Section 1B. We forced applicants to respond to the request for information, the RFI. Now, there was some backlash uh, from both the stakeholders and examining attorneys that we were being too strict on good faith filers. So, in 2020, we issued a revised guide that allowed the applicants to respond to a refusal and an RFI with substitute specimens or amend to 1B without having to provide the proof of use in response to the RFI. Now, the feedback we're getting now, uh, for instance, from stakeholders and from the Office of the Inspector General, again, in that report, is that even when the images don't appear fake on their face, the examining attorney should nonetheless investigate whether the mark is in actual use in commerce by going to websites and trying to figure out whether they can buy the products online. Now, technically, the examining attorneys have the discretion to investigate if their spidey senses are going off based on the information in the record, but they're not required to do that. That would grind examination to a halt as examiners started going down online rabbit holes trying to investigate whether a mark is in use or not as to every goods or services in good or service in the record. So to assist our examiners with collecting the evidence of non-use, because the examiners are going to have a hard time trying to investigate non-use in every case. So to assist that and, and get this evidence in front of the examiners, we opened up the letter of protest program. It allows third parties to submit evidence of non-use for our consideration under limited circumstances. So as a reminder, going back to letters of protest, typically third parties cannot intervene in someone else's trademark application without filing an opposition at the TTAB, the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. Now the letter of protest procedure, which has been in place for a long time, allows third parties to send evidence to the USPTO regarding another's application. We review that evidence and we determine whether the evidence is relevant to a ground of refusal. And if so, we will forward that evidence to the examining attorney. Not argument, evidence, right? This is a way that third parties can bring some evidence to our attention that we might otherwise have missed or we didn't have access to. Now, because our examining attorneys were not historically issuing refusals for non-use, just a bad specimen refusal, we didn't allow for letters of protest to address non-use issues. But that changed in 2019 when we opened that specimen protest mailbox, you might remember that, uh, and we allowed third parties to submit evidence of the same image in an application being used by third parties in the marketplace without the trademark on it. Same image, no trademark, and suddenly that's appearing in, in our files. Uh, also the same image appearing in multiple prior applications, all bearing different marks. Now we took a conservative approach uh, to the types of evidence that could be submitted so that the letter of protest procedure didn't become a proxy for a board proceeding. Um, in late 2020, we published a rule change that essentially codified the letter of protest proceedings into regulations in anticipation, in, 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 eh, anticipation of the implementation of the Trademark Modernization Act. 
the TMA allowed us to begin charging a $50 fee for protests to recover our costs. We were getting more and more protests. We needed, we needed to cover our costs because it's, it's work to, to review these. Uh, but that meant we actually had to close the free specimen protest mailbox and move that process into the existing letter of protest process. So we did that. And as we did that, we also expanded the evidence that we'll consider in a letter of protest related to specimens. Because examiners are looking at evidence of non-use, now it's appropriate that third-party pr uh, protesters uh, can also submit that evidence of non-use for our consideration. So we will con now consider evidence that a specimen was digitally altered or created, or evidence that demonstrates that a specimen was not in use on or prior to the date it was submitted. What we will not take is evidence that you can't find the product on the internet, unless you have other evidence of non-use. Such evidence standing alone doesn't tell us whether the goods bearing the mark were offered for sale at the time the applicant averred that it was offered for sale, uh, nor does it tell us whether the mark is in use, uh, particularly if the goods and services are not ones that are sold online typically. So those who want to learn more about our letter of protest uh, proceeding, procedures, I'd, I'd encourage you to go to our website. I'll have a link at the end of the slides here. Um, go to the page called Letters of Protest Practice Tips, and that will provide information that, that I'm sharing with you today and generally how, how the letter of protest process works. Now, we're still looking at ways to improve specimen examination, uh, but it doesn't seem to us like more guidance is going to be a silver bullet here. Uh, so we're seeking more options uh, that might not require so much time spent on investigation by our examining attorneys but where that investigation could be done by others or automated, that sort of thing. Our primary focus though right now is on bad faith submissions, including bad specimens, is our, our new and evolving administrative sanction processes, which pull cases out of examination for review and investigation. So let me tell you a little bit about that. Now, anytime a new filing trend evolves, we arm our 700 examining attorneys with the legal policy guidance that they need to handle that trend. For years, they have been on the front line uh, of their battle against individual bad faith actors. But when it comes to these larger schemes and scams that we're seeing in all kinds of trademark filings, individual examining attorneys are not in a position to be able to spot a filing trend or respond with a coordinated action across thousands of affected applications. For example, uh, fake specimens often come in large waves of virtually identical specimens in applications listing different owners. Because the owners differ, they aren't grouped as co-pendings or companion applications when they're assigned for examination to our, to our examiners. And that makes it harder to detect the waves and handle those consistently. So to, de to address that, in 2019, we created the Special Task Force on Improper Activities. Uh, it's led by attorneys in trademark operations and trademark po examination policy, but they coordinate investigations with personnel th throughout the USPTO. Now, what are they investigating? A variety of things. False claims of use. Applicants or registrants that cannot establish use in commerce. Um, filing firms or applicants that submit fake or doctored specimens. They're looking at U.S. counsel circumvention. Applications featuring uh, false attorney names or false U.S. addresses submissions featuring U.S. attorney names that are real, um, uh, but where the attorney is actually unaware uh, that they have shown up in a file, that they've appeared in a file. They don't have a representation agreement with the client. We also are investigating offers to rent U.S. attorney's bar credentials. We're looking into unauthorized practice of law, non-attorney filing firms that provide advice or appear in submissions. We are looking at filing firms that forge signatures on declarations or applications. We're looking at trafficking in applications or registrations. Um, we've seen hijacking through unauthorized changes of correspondence address in our records. Um, we see brands that are hijacked through unauthorized applications using accurate company information, but with a different or unauthorized correspondence address snuck into it, to the application. And we've seen applicants stockpiling registrations for use on e-commerce platforms storefronts. We're also looking into scam solicitations. These are those that are solicitations that are meant to appear as, as if they originate from the USPTO. They use our public information and they dupe applicants or registrants into paying for services that they don't need uh, or that they never receive. Um, investigation process. The special task force uh, takes in reports of suspicious filings from a variety of sources. We've got examining attorneys that are reporting uh, possible fraudulent activity and applications through an internal mailbox. 
uh, we've got our data analytics uh, staff. They're looking for suspicious filing trends in the data. Um, law enforcement investigating criminal behavior, they'll, they'll reach out to us. Uh, we also see the media reports that you see uh, calling out possible fraudulent behavior that affects U.S. applicants. We get customer complaints. Uh, they come through the Trademark Assistance Center, TAC. Uh, we see stuff coming into TM scams at USPTO.gov or TM policy at USPTO.gov mailboxes. Uh, we see stuff in the petitions to the director and we see stuff in letters of protest. So when we get those reports or when we discover things, we'll launch an investigation into those allegations of fraudulent activity and we determine whether what the nature of the misconduct is and any, look for any available circumstantial evidence indicating the intent of the applicant. Now, some applicants simply misunderstand U.S. rules, and those cases can be handled by examining attorneys through office actions. Other applicants or representatives upon investigation appear to be trying to circumvent U.S. rules or abuse our electronic systems. Now, those folks might be subject to administrative or criminal sanctions. Now, there are three main avenues um, where we can look at sanctions against actors um, after we go through an investigation. So we have uh, the Commissioner of Trademarks Authority to sanction violators of U.S. rules of practice, the Office of Enrollment and Disciplines Authority to sanction violators of U.S. rules of professional conduct, and we see uh, law enforcement authority to pursue criminal prosecution of those violating criminal laws or um, show up in U.S. applications or other submissions. Now, the one that the Special Task Force um, has the most control over is the authority of the Commissioner for Trademarks. Uh, the authority is to manage and direct all aspects of the activities of the USPTO that affect the administration of trademark operations. So this includes the authority to impose sanctions on parties who file submissions in trademark matters in violation of USPTO rules of practice, professional conduct, or terms of use of our website. Um, as part of our investigation process, though, uh, the Special Task Force will also collect evidence and refer appropriate cases to OED or to law enforcement. So when we discover a scheme, we identify affected applications and sequester unsigned applications into holding dockets. We direct the examining attorneys to suspend action on those, those applications, and then we start collecting evidence and establish what rules have been violated or we think have been violated. Depending on the nature of those violations, we have two options for moving forward. We can direct the examining attorneys to issue the appropriate refusals or request information, or we can issue a show cause order. Uh, it directs the offending party to explain the conduct that appears to violate USPTO rules. Uh, it will identify potential sanctions and it will set a deadline for a response. Now, after we evaluate the response, if we get one, uh, we can then move to an order for sanctions. The sanctions include not considering uh, or giving any weight to the affected submission, terminating the proceeding before the USPTO, including abandoning the application, precluding parties from filing on behalf of themselves or others in any trademark matter before the USPTO, referring practitioners to OED, and terminating affected USPTO.gov accounts through which all electronic forms are filed. Now, if a representative, an attorney, is implicated in the applications featuring the rule violations, trademarks will refer uh, to OED for investigation and possible discipline. Now, OED may investigate suspected violations of the rules of professional conduct by attorneys appearing before the USPTO, and the OED director may issue warnings, institute formal charges against the practitioner, or enter into a settlement agreement with the, the attorney. OED also has the attorney to ref the authority to refer the attorney to his or her state bar for reciprocal discipline. Now, in cases involving criminal activity or suspected criminal activity, trademarks will refer the matter to the Department of Commerce's Office of the Inspector General, who then may refer the matter to other law enforcement agencies. Now, using this administrative sanction process, uh, most recently, the Commissioner for Trademarks has issued several orders for sanctions and we continue to issue show cause orders, and these are all available on our website. I have a link at the end of this presentation. Um, this first one on this slide, Mr. Nyo, in late 2020, we issued a short show cause order 
and then an order for sanctions to this individual in Vietnam who was responsible for over 300 changes of correspondence address and trademark registrations, primarily owned by banking institutions. Now, we have worked with our uh, OCIO, our, our chief, um, uh, our folks over in IT, and we locked all of his USPTO.gov accounts. We've taken additional measures to try to identify and block any new accounts he might try to open. Now, we have uh, login requirements phase two and phase three that I'll explain later, and we hope that'll make this process easier to lock down these accounts uh, going forward. Um, now, we also issued uh, a final order in late 20, uh, let, let's see, was late November 2020. We identified one application for a well-known mark. It was filed in the name of the legitimate owner, uh, but the correspondence address clearly belonged to somebody else. Um, we identified several more um, uh, examples of that in the next few months, and we handled each of those case by case. Um, but our investigation kind of showed uh, that there was something going on here. There was a scheme. So we issued a show cause order uh, to the individual that was implicated in the USPTO.gov accounts filing these. We requested an explanation. After an unsatisfactory response, we issued an order for sanctions. We terminated those applications, and we have precluded this individual from making further submissions and locked his accounts. Uh, now, recently in June, we issued a show cause order um, to uh, an IP uh, firm in China. The order required evidence and information that would explain uh, whether Ms. Zhang and her employees were authorized to practice before the USPTO and why her USPTO.gov account were used to file thousands of applications featuring fake names, fake domicile addresses, and fake signatures. We're currently evaluating the response and determining next steps. A couple of other things I wanted to bring your attention to. Um, I talked about OED, so I wanted to share some, some information. Um, OED looks at attorney misconduct related to trademark schemes and scams, and, and they recently entered into a settlement agreement with Mr. Liu, a New York licensed attorney based in China. Mr. Liu had a service agreement with a Shenzhen IP company to file U.S. applications on behalf of that, for that company's uh, clients. Now, the agreement states, the OED agreement states that Lou did not personally advise nor personally enter his electronic signature on any of the thousands of applications in which he appeared. Now, OED has uh, suspended Mr. Lou from practice before the USPTO. He's required to take corrective action before he can re reappear on a probationary basis. Another order, actually, that just came out. Um, here, we have another settlement agreement with a U.S. attorney, a California-based attorney, uh, who has been providing trademark advice or trademark legal services since 2005. Um, she had a service agreement with an Indian company to review and sign trademark applications that were prepared by the foreign company uh, at a rate of $100 per hour. Um, she was listed as an attorney of record in uh, 2,300 applications filed over a five-month period. Uh, she, the settlement agreement, you can go and look at it. There's a link at the end of my slides here. Um, she reviewed and signed the applications, but said her reviews were sometimes inadequate, and she did not take reasonable steps to ensure the applicants were properly advised. Uh, she has been uh, then, uh, if you read the agreement, you'll see that she has been reprimanded, is on probation. Um, she has to do trademark and ethics CLE, and she must review the trademark manual of examination procedure. So we're pretty happy about that. And now we're going to move on. Misleading solicitations. Okay, so we're taking aggressive actions to stop bad actors, and we also need to warn our customers about these, these, what's going on there. We need to warn our customers about what we're seeing in the way of scams, what we're doing about it, and what they can do to protect themselves. So we are, are really ramping up our web content to provide more information about our work and our resources um, and, and try to uh, you know, address those who have been affected by these schemes or who might be affected. Uh, so certainly look uh, for more information on our website. We are ramping up efforts. It's a, a huge machine that we're trying to get started. So be patient with us as we try to make sure um, we are, are, are providing all the information that our customers need. Um, so one of these pages here, you'll see it, the scam alert uh, page. It has a list of entities that are sending out potentially misleading solicitations uh, that other customers have received and reported to us. And we, we have links to all of those examples of those solicitations on our website. Now, one of those I want to draw your attention to actually worked out pretty well for us. So 
uh, law enforcement was investigating a mail fraud scheme, and they came across that list on the last slide of our, our uh, misleading solicitations. They were investigating a, a scammer, Victor Sokolikov, uh, who ran a three-year, multimillion-dollar mail fraud scheme to defraud trademark holders. Uh, Sokolikov's company, the Patent and Trademark Office, LLC, and I guess he was also running the Patent and Trademark Bureau, LLC, uh, sent out renewal notices to holders indicating a renewal date that was earlier than what our record said. Uh, the notices included a QR code that linked to our site and asked holders to pay him uh, the inflated renewal fees, which they did. Uh, 2,900 victims uh, fell for this scheme. The government inv agents who were investigating the scheme found the misleading solicitation that we had on our website, and that actually helped their, them you know, uh, find the scammer and, and go after him. The government actually was able to seize $2.4 million in Sikorikov's assets uh, that now can be used to compensate the victims of the schemes. Uh, those, the uh, U.S. attorneys who were investigating asked for our assistance in identifying affected applicants. They had about 200 of uh, their applicants, that, uh, the victims of the scheme that they couldn't find, and we helped uh, provide them information about um, where those applicants could be located so they could get the uh, get some restitution from uh, from the defendant in this case. So we're pretty happy uh, that this guy has been uh, sentenced to four years and ordered to pay $4.5 million in restitution. All right, moving on. On our uh, Register Protection Initiative, now we're at uh, 2019's U.S. Council Rule. Um, I'm guessing that you're all familiar with this rule requiring foreign domiciliaries to be represented by a U.S. licensed attorney in trademark matters before the U.S. PTO. If I had to guess, the reason that you are uh, familiar with it is all the media attention paid to it um, by those who are attempting to circumvent the rule. Uh, as you know, the U.S. Council Rule requires all applicants, represented or unrepresented, to provide us their domicile address so we can evaluate whether the council rule is triggered. Now, what we see, of course, are attempts to circumvent the rule. We see fake names, fake addresses located in the U.S., and we see U.S. attorneys who, are, um, who have agreed to rent their uh, attorney credentials to uh, an applicant or a foreign filing firm to use to file in the United States. So what are we doing about these unacceptable addresses? Um, it's been a, a tough slog because if we rely on our examining attorneys to use Google Earth to try to investigate each and every address to figure out really is it an, a residence, is it a real address, what is it, it's not the, the most efficient use of their time and their training. Uh, so we have implemented some automated queries. We're looking for PO boxes, we're looking for care of boxes, we're looking for commercial mail receiving agency addresses. We flag these um, as uh, unacceptable, and we uh, let our examining attorneys know that they need to, uh, to is issue a refusal or a request for information or, or however they might want to handle it in order to get an acceptable address. We're also seeking ways to have an automated verification, address verification check up front uh, during the application stage or during pre-exam. So we're still looking at what is the uh, most efficient way to do this with the least impact on good faith filers. All right, so what are we doing about the attorney misconduct, those who are trying to um, uh, circumvent the U.S. counsel rule? Um, as part of our investigation process, uh, we identify attorneys that are seemingly involved in schemes who are violating our rules or they're violating ethics rules, and we collect evidence, uh, and when appropriate, as I said, we refer them to OED or to law enforcement if there's criminal activity. Now, we have referred dozens of matters over to OED and a couple of matters over to law enforcement over the last year or two. Um, what we hear is that, that a lot of attorneys who are then being investigated will claim ignorance of our signature rules. They'll, they'll claim they didn't know about their own ethics rules. Uh, they'll claim they, they didn't know a lot of the TMEP. We've actually had um, have discussions, uh, as I understand it, to try to point out where the TMEP is on our website to some of these attorneys who are violating their rules. Now, do they really not know, or is that just uh, um, where, when they're asked, that's what they say? Don't know. Um, we're certainly going to continue to to press and investigate and and uh, discipline those uh, who are circumventing our rules and violating their own rules of professional conduct. Um, you saw those two OED settlement agreements uh, resulting from our referrals over to OED for specific uh, practitioners. But uh, and you can track OED's uh, settlement agreement. You can you can track their final orders um, if you go to our FOIA reading room. So FOIA reading room uh, USPTO. OED, you'll find a list of, of all of those agreements or final orders. Uh, and one thing I would say is that it is possible uh, for you all, 
to file a grievance against an attorney uh, if you think that there are grounds uh, for discipline of that, uh, of that particular practitioner. Uh, and you are invited to file a grievance, uh, OED at USPTO.gov. Uh, so if you find evidence of attorney misconduct and you want to let the OED folks know, please do so through OED at USPTO.gov. Um, let's see. I'm looking to see if I, yeah, you know, I think we'll come to those questions at the end. That's a really long one. It'll take me a while to read. <laughs> okay, moving on to the next initiative is mandatory account login. Again, in 2019, busy year, we began requiring USPTO.gov account for filing any TEAS form, and that allows us to track filing behavior. Um, we have two more upcoming phases that I want to tell you about that will further increase the scrutiny uh, I'm sorry, further increase the security of our database uh, and better tracking for us. So we're pretty happy about that. Phase two, identity verification. It's currently in beta testing. We're partnering with IDME uh, to authenticate the owners of USPTO.gov accounts used to file uh, TEAS forms. Uh, the automated process requires a government photo ID, a uh, government issued photo ID, a uh, USPTO.gov account that matches the ID. It requires a smartphone, computer, or tablet with a front-facing camera. It requires a Social Security number. Uh, and those without a Social Security number, such as foreign nationals, will be routed to an in-person uh, video session to verify the, those identities. If you don't want to do the automated option, you can still do paper. You can do a paper notarized form, uh, but obviously that will take a lot longer. Once we verify identities, we can terminate USPTO.gov accounts and then prevent new accounts by that same bad actor from being created once the sanctions are imposed. So that will allow us to lock down uh, accounts and hopefully keep them from popping back up again. Uh, let's see, uh, phase three uh, of login is role-based access controls. Uh, the USPTO plans on assigning a limited number of roles to control and delegate um, access to TEAS form filings. The proposed rules are, uh, the po I'm sorry, the proposed roles are, I think I have a slide on this. Did I miss that? Yes, I did. Okay, sorry about that. There we go. Uh, the roles, a uh, U.S. licensed attorney, a Canadian attorney or agent, uh, attorney support staff, and trademark owner. Only authorized customers uh, with those roles will be able to file TEAS forms related to the application or registration. What will this do for us? It will stop hijacking. It will stop the unauthorized changes of correspondence addresses uh, that we see. Uh, and, you know, they have certainly gone down, as, but it, it's a manual process for us and, and rather uh, labor intensive. So uh, to be able to have a way to stop that from happening uh, and, and uh, improve the security of our systems is, is much, uh, much uh, welcome from, from our standpoint and hopefully from yours. All right. Now we're going to move on to our last stop on our Register Protection Initiative timelines. It's certainly, well, it's not our last stop. It's our most recent stop. We're going to still continue to work on various initiatives to make sure that our register remains uh, accurate and useful. 2018-2019. Um, we faced a surge of applications, and they had sketchy specimens in them. Uh, Congress asked us how they could help, um, how we, what we would need from a statutory perspective to respond to the trend and to deal with the overall concern about false claims of use in trademark applications and maintenance filing. Now, Congress passed the TMA and gave us until December 27, 2021, to implement uh, most of the proceedings necessitated by the statute. Now, we were in a hurry. We, we normally would have issued a request for comments, and then we would have gone out with a notice of proposed rulemaking, and then we would have gone to a final rule, but we didn't have that kind of time. Um, so we did some, a bunch of roundtables, uh, which are on our website. There's a link at the end uh, to our TMA page, which will uh, link you to all the, the roundtables that we had. Um, in those consultations with stakeholders through the roundtables, then we drafted a notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, we issued it for public comments. We had more roundtables. And now the final rule is being drafted. Now, what's in the the the, uh, the final rule? We've got the letter of protest procedure. Procedure. We got flexible response periods and non-use cancellation proceedings. So those are the three main features of the TMA that are in the rule package. Um, letter of protest. It's the same proceeding that you've known for years. It's nothing has has changed. Um, it just a few tweaks. Uh, the legislation authorizes, as I said, to charge a fee of fifty dollars to cover our cost. 
and Congress imposed a two-month time limit for sending the relevant evidence to the examining attorney. Everything remains the same as you've always known it. Uh, flexible response periods. Um, we offered three options in the NPR. We got comments, um, and let's see, I think I have a slide on that, so let's go there. No, okay, I took that one out. Um, let's see, right now, you know, for an office action and examination, you've got a six-month response period, and, and that might be reasonable and necessary. I think it was started back when we had boats crossing with office actions and responses. Um, so it still may be reasonable and even necessary for a particularly complex office action, but it's it's not necessary for all. Uh, and that time lag that, um, where applications are, are taking up space in our system longer than they need to, that means it's harder to clear marks. And, and it's particularly frustrating if the applications that are sitting there are suspicious ones. Um, so we are looking for ways to increase the flexibility for us to move applications through the system more quickly uh, and uh, certainly to, to move applications through for the benefit of our stakeholders to try to clear marks a little bit faster, get marks off the register. We are reviewing the comments on the various options that we presented as we develop the final rule. Um, and just be aware, we, we did propose a delayed implementation date for flexible response periods. Um, we know we have docketing issues, you have docketing issues, uh, and so we are taking that into account as to um, delaying implementation. So don't look for flexible response periods to be implemented in December 2021 because uh, it's not going to happen. Don't worry, it will be delayed. Um, but I really want to focus on non-use cancellation proceedings because that's really where, from a register protection initiative, the, the action is. Okay, let's talk about um, non-use cancellation. The first type of proceeding is expungement. Um, the target of an expungement proceeding is a Section 1, a Section 44, or a Section 66 registration that has never been used on some or all of the goods and services identified in the registration. There are three types of proceedings in which this new claim or new ground for cancellation is available. Number one, a petition-initiated proceedings before the director. Number two, a director-initiated proceeding before the director. And third is a cancellation proceeding at the TTAB um, now, the first two types of proceedings here before the director, they may be instituted in the window of time between year three and year 10 after registration. The third type of proceeding um, before uh, the board is a bit different. The timing is different. The claim is available any time after the first three years post-registration, but it doesn't cut off at 10 years like the proceedings before the director. So keep that in mind, uh, an expungement proceeding is any time post-registration three years, okay? Now, a point of distinction here. The claim of expungement is fundamentally different from a claim of abandonment. Abandonment, as you know, uh, requires non-use plus an intent not to resume use. Expungement does not look at the registrant's intent. We're not evaluating the intent of the registrant. It's an entirely new statutory basis for cancellation. It only evaluates whether the mark was used on the challenged goods and services prior to the date of filing of the expungement petition. It does not evaluate whether the mark was put into use as of the dates required by the statute. That is a question for reexamination proceeding, which let's turn to next. Congress created the second new proceeding before the director called reexamination. The target is Section 1 registrations that were not in use as of the relevant date. The relevant date it, for purposes of this proceeding in a Section 1A is the application filing date. The relevant date for a 1B application is the later of the filing date of the amendment to alleged use, the AAU, or the expiration of time to file the SOU, the statement of use. As for timing, a petition to request institution of proceedings for reexamination may be filed in the first five years after registration. There are two new types of proceedings before the director in which this claim is available, as you see here, petition initiated and director initiated. Note that I did not put the third proceeding before the board uh, for reexamination like I had it for expungement. Why? This is because this, this ground already exists. This claim, ground for cancellation, non-use as of the relevant date, is already there in Section 14. You can bring it to the TTAB. These reexamination proceedings before the director do not affect the existing non-use claim at the TTAB as to evidence 
or as to timing. There's no relationship. Now let me walk you through the proceeding. Well, actually, let me tell you what the petition says first. Hold on. Okay. So the MPRM that you all hopefully reviewed very carefully and provided comments to us, which for which we really appreciate uh, those comments, um, it lays out the matching procedures that will be followed in both expungement and reexamination proceedings. Uh, to start with, we're proposing a $600 per class fee. Now that was um, a point of contention in the comments, so we are looking at that in the final rule. Uh, the statute says, uh, any person may file a petition requesting that either expungement or reexamination proceeding be instituted. To file the petition, however, the petitioner must have a USPTO.gov account. So we know who they are. Now, we might not know who the real party in interest is, but we know who the petitioner is. The petition must include a verified statement, uh, as well as any docu documentary evidence of non-use. The verified statement must identify the elements of the petitioner's investigation for non-use. Where did you search? How did you search? When did you search? And what did you find as to each of the sources of information relied on? Now, the reasonableness of the search and the number and the nature of the sources the petitioner must search will be determined case by case because, of course, industry sectors differ. Non-use evidence is not going to be found in the same place for every industry sector. So there is no one, one size fits all here. Uh, and the, uh, the, the MPRM reflects that uh, as to uh, case by case analysis. Now, once a complete petition is filed and has all of the required elements, a courtesy email notice of the filing of the petition will go to the registrant and the registrant's attorney if we have one in our files. We want the registrant to be notified early that something is happening. Uh, the petition and the evidence will also be uploaded immediately into the Trademark Status and Document Retrieval System, TSDR, and it will be made public. Okay, the procedures, how do they go? Once that petition is submitted and is complete, uh, the petitioner is entirely out of the process. It is the director who decides whether the prima facie case is made based on evidence and information in the petition and our records, the electronic record of the involved registrations. We're not just looking at the petition, we're also looking at our records. The director has the authority to institute proceedings um, without a petition if the director has evidence of uh, establishing a prima facie case. The same procedures as those listed here would apply to a director-initiated proceedings. It just doesn't have the petition or the verified statement. If a prima facie case is established, the director must institute proceedings. If a proceeding is instituted, the examiner will issue both a notice of institution and an office action that direct the registrant to respond within two months with proof of use of the mark on the challenged goods or services. Now, I said two months here. Uh, but of course, in our uh, request, in our comments, we got a lot of, of different views as to how long that per period would be, and we are looking that in the final rule. So before you gasp at the two months, let's wait and see what the final rule says. Now, the registrant has three options for his or her response, provide evidence of use, excusable non-use, or deletion. Now, let's walk through those options, right? If the registrant provides an acceptable response, the proceedings are terminated, so everything's done. Um, now, if the registrant provides um, evidence of use, the, the registrant has to rebut the prima facie case with evidence of, of use, information, exhibits, affidavits, declarations that establish that the required use of commerce has been made on or in connection with the goods and services that are being challenged. Second, the registrant can provide evidence supporting excusable non-use, but only in limited circumstances. The statute sets out that this only applies to a section 44 or 66 registrant in the context of an expungement proceeding. This does not apply in reexamination. Now third, the third option is deletion. A registrant may simply just delete all of the challenged goods and services in his or her res uh, response with immediate effect, uh, and then we move on, right? Uh, if the response is acceptable, if any one of, any th one of those three is, is, uh, is taken care of and it's acceptable, then the we will terminate the proceedings and everybody goes home. Okay, now what happens though in a second scenario here where the registrant's response is unacceptable? The examiner will issue uh, a final action then that includes the examiner's decision that the registration should be canceled for each good or service for which the registrant did not provide an acceptable response or for non-compliance with any requirement under the U.S. Council rule, the electronic correspondence rule, or the domicile address rule. We will go final on a requirement under those three. 
the registrant must respond to the final action within two months uh, with a request for reconsideration and a notice of appeal. Now, if that request for reconsideration contains acceptable proof of use or deletions, then we're done. We will terminate proceedings and walk away. But if not, um, the examiner's decision to cancel is appealed to the TTAB, and then everything goes to the board. Regular timelines apply. Now, we have a third scenario here. No response. Registrant does not respond. Uh, no response results in immediate cancellation for the goods and services on which the proceeding was instituted. Not the entire registration, just those where uh, the proceeding was instituted, uh, unless, of course, the whole thing was, was challenged. Now, once the goods and services are ordered for cancellation, a petition for reinstatement is available, but only for an extraordinary situation. So if uh, the office action was not received um, and there's an extraordinary situation for which it was not received, uh, we can consider that in a petition for reinstatement. All right. Now, remember I said that any person may file, and that's in the statute. So there's no standing requirement um, for the petitioner. Now that has raised some concerns um, that there may be abuse, and we totally understand that. So, but there's several provisions built into the statute or that we propose to implement that will help prevent the abuse. The director is the gatekeeper. Um, the director makes the call on whether a prima facie case has been made, and neither the petitioner nor the registrant may appeal that determination. If the evidence of non-use makes the prima facie, prima facie case, and only then will proceedings be instituted. Secondly, uh, estoppel. We have estoppel provisions. Goods and services for which use in commerce has already been established may not be subject to further expungement or reexamination proceedings. They can still be challenged at the board, but in the context of these proceedings, if a registrant has provided acceptable proof of use for go those goods and services that were challenged, those goods and services cannot be challenged again in these proceedings. Uh, third, administrative sanctions. Now, I just told you all about our administ administrative sanctions process. So, if we see that a petitioner is abusing these proceedings, they're harassing registrants, we can sanction them outside the context of these proceedings uh, through the authority of the Commissioner for Trademarks that I told you all about. So if we were just to discover that there was a problem, we could stop that petitioner from, um, from filing future submissions in any, any proceeding before the USPTO, um, and we could terminate their USPTO.gov account. Um, and once we have phase two, of our um, uh, login requirements, then we could um, certainly stop them from creating new accounts. So that is certainly a help. Um, and lastly, relationship to other proceedings. Now, as a fourth measure here, we're proposing that uh, expungement and reexamination proceedings be included among the types of proceedings for which suspension of action by the office or the TTAB is authorized. So your normal suspension rules will apply. Let's see, all right. Timeline. Um, this is the TMA implementation timeline, so don't uh, confuse this with the first one you saw uh, for register protection. We're working on the final rule. Uh, it will lay out the implementation of the provisions in the TMA, and it will also identify the dates of entry into force of the various provisions. We are looking to publish this final rule in November 2021. Um, we, again, we're planning on implementing the non-use cancellation provisions by December 18th, hopefully. Um, the weekend before Christmas, so it doesn't hit on Christmas. Um, and of course, the statute mandates that we have to have expungement and reexamination in place by at least December 27, 2021. Um, so look for that. Now, one uh, public service announcement. Update your owner email and correspondence email addresses and all your registrations to make sure uh, that you'll get notice of, uh, you know, at filing of these particular petitions. We don't want anybody caught off guard, so make sure that you keep everything in your records accurate, in our records accurate, so that we can contact you uh, if one of these are filed. And again, a plea, update your registrations as to um, only those services that are in use. Use the Section 7 amendment proceeding um, and, uh, and delete any unused goods and services so that you don't get caught up in one of these um, proceedings. Lastly, I mentioned that we had a bunch of slides with links, uh, and they actually go to each of the initiatives that I mentioned here today. Uh, these will be available uh, as part of this recording and, and on our website. Uh, so, so go and, and go back and take some time and look at all of these uh, links. And here you can see uh, the, uh, the, the administrative sanction orders that we issue here. 
Um, now keep in mind, this website is clunky and we're working on it. Uh, we certainly want to make it easier for you all to find what we're doing. Uh, and we are working on a, you know, a web page overhaul, honestly, uh, on all our protect, uh, register protection initiatives so we can make it easier for everybody to find what they're looking for. Uh, these are the OED settlement agreements uh, that were, I just talked about. Uh, if a party uh, has, been has been excluded by an OED order, you'd find that here. And here's the Trademark Modernization Act link, and it has all the recordings and all the slides and all the information that uh, we have to offer you on the Trademark Modernization Act. So that, my friends, is my presentation, and I'm going to throw it to Jason now. All right, thank you very much, Amy. Uh, we are going to be moving now into the question and answer uh, portion. Uh, so we're going to be joined here by Bob Lavash. Uh, but just a quick reminder, folks, for those of you who are sending in questions, uh, the email address to use is tmfeedback at uspto.gov. Uh, we understand a couple of you might have sent some questions into another at uspto.gov uh, email address. So we're trying to collect any questions that might have come to another email address. But please, if you could, uh, send them to tmfeedback at uspto.gov. I know we've had a couple come in, uh, so hopefully we have some good questions for Amy and Bob to answer. So let me give you a little bio on Bob because he's uh, now joining us. We want you to know who he is. Uh, he's the Senior Trademark Legal Policy Advisor in the USPTO's Office of the Deputy Commissioner for Trademark Examination Policy and is the Assistant Editor of the Trademark Manual of Examining Procedure. He started at the USPTO in 2005, working five years as a trademark examining attorney before becoming a legal policy staff attorney. His current responsibilities as Senior Trademark Legal Policy Advisor include managing the work of legal policy staff attorneys and developing trademark examination policy guidance. He also provides counsel on rulemaking and various trademark legal policy topics, including specimens of use, non-traditional marks, lawful use in commerce, geographic certification marks, practice before the USPTO, and statutorily protected matter. In addition, Bob serves as a liaison to the USPTO's Office of Enrollment and Discipline and assists with the enhancement of the USPTO's trademark electronic application system. He is a graduate of the University of Miami and Cornell Law School and is a member of the bars of New York and the District of Columbia. So, as you can tell, folks, you are in really great hands. Uh, these are two people who really know what they're talking about, uh, the experts in the field. Uh, so I'm going to turn it back to you two, and uh, let's uh, hear some good answers to some of these good questions. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry I couldn't get to a lot of these questions as we were going through, but it was difficult to stay on track and, and address the questions at the same time. But um, we will turn to those now. Um, the first question that we got is, is there a process for a third party to report a registration which should be audited? Um, the, everybody wants to report somebody else's bad guy work, and that can be a little tough uh, because you never know um, if it's a real or, or just somebody trying to harass somebody else. So we do have to be careful about the various inputs um, uh, that, w that we, we get. Now, with regard to um, a registration where, um, you, you know, because the registration has been issued and, and we're not in a position to, uh, to, you know, look into that registration. At this point, we would direct you to the expungement or reexamination uh, proceedings that we will be implementing uh, December 27th, or actually it should be December 18th. Well, we'll have to see what the, the date is at that point. Um, but if you find that there is a registration uh, where you believe that there is evidence of non-use and you can find that evidence of non-use and you have a prima facie case of non-use, then we urge you to use that proceeding uh, to, take, uh, to take an action against that. That then, of course, gives that information to us. We look to see if you've made a prima facie case. Uh, and if you have made a prima facie case, then we will ask the registrant um, to provide proof of use. So that would be... Uh, the mechanism by which you would uh, address one of these. The proof of use audit program is is not something that third parties can opine on or or, or give us uh, um, uh, ping us to to audit somebody. That's not how the program works. And I think you can appreciate that it could be used for harassment uh, if we were to allow it to to be used that way. So I appreciate the question, but definitely I think these reexamination proceedings will be helpful in that regard. Okay, next question. Bob, is this uh, before a we get to the next one, there. Yeah. 
Oh, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, we could. Um, but before you get to that, there was a related question about whether the letter of protest procedure could be used for registration. And the answer is no, that's for uh, pre registration um, during pendency of the application up until 30 days after it's published for opposition. So, no. And, um, and under current audit procedures, the uh, the audit is done on a random basis based on uh, criteria being met uh, relating to the ID of goods or services. Right. Now, Bob, you were doing that um, stuttering uh, thing. Your your connection isn't <laughs> great, so I know you love that. <laughs> so for those who uh, okay, for those who uh, didn't catch all that because you're not a robot, um, the, uh, the 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 issue is a letter of protest proceeding is only available for applications. It is not available for registrations. Um, and so, you know, we're not we're not going to open up a registration because a letter of protest was filed because that's not what the proceeding is for. Um, so uh, that was that was the long and short of of what what Bob said. Okay. Um, let's see. With regard to um, the question about uh, letters of protest and what is an example of good evidence of non-use of a mark, I'm going to direct you to the letter of protest <clears throat> practice tip page. I think you'll find some really good information there. I don't really want to get into, uh, you know, getting pinned down into what is good evidence of non-use and what is not good evidence of non-use at this stage. I, I don't think that that's uh, um, probably a good use on, on this recording. <laughs> um, so please go to the letter of protest practice tip page uh, to find some, some good information about that. Uh, and let's see. Can you provide a link to the Inspector General report uh, that I mentioned several times? Uh, sure, I believe that it was on the, off the Department of Commerce Office of Inspector General's page. Um, so that's not something that we wrote. Uh, it's something that we have responded to um, but I would note that that report was issued based on um, a sample of applications that the auditors looked at dating back to 2019. Uh, and as you can, can recognize from this talk, um, that we have done a whole lot of work since 2019 to address the issue uh, that were raised in the report. Uh, and certainly, as I also said, it is a machine, a large machine that we're trying to get moving um, and it's, uh, it's certainly slow to ramp up and rev up. Uh, and so we're, we're certainly um, trying to, to move as quickly as we can and, and devote a lot of resources to it. Uh, but we are, uh, it, it takes some time to, to get there. Uh, so I, while we appreciate the, the issues that the Inspector General raised uh, for us to look at, um, we've been looking at those for a very long time. Uh, and we think we have found some good ways forward to address those issues uh, that we've been doing, as you can see from from my timeline that we've, we've, we've done this for a long time. Okay. Um, next question is, does the USPTO consider that the attorneys who are involved in fraudulent fi filings might, may also be deceived by the applicant? In other words, simply because an attorney is involved in a maintenance filing in which it is determined there is an improper or fraudulent specimen, does that mean the attorney is complicit with the applicant in intending to deceive the USPTO. Uh, in addition, problems with use and what be, can be claimed as use in commerce can also be caused by the applicant's failure to understand what proper use is, despite being properly instructed by their counsel as to what type of use is proper to support a trademark maintenance filing. Um, where should we as practitioners report the fraudulent solicitations our clients receive? Okay, so there's two different issues here. The first one is a concern that a, an attorney is not being told the truth by the applicant, um, and therefore then the attorney might not be complicit. Well, certainly uh, that is something that if an attorney was to be, you know, investigated by OED if a grievance were filed or if a referral came from us over to OED, uh, that would certainly come out in the conversations uh, with OED. So uh, I certainly don't want to, you know, we understand that. That's why there's an investigation process that, that is behind this. Um, and certainly we do understand that applicants uh, many times fail to understand proper use. Um, and then give you, th there's only so much that you as an attorney can do. We would like to see, you know, best practices out in the marketplace. And we, we do believe that there, there are best practices. Uh, we would love to see best practices more widely used 
um, by more attorneys who are practicing before us um, in, tr in terms of educating applicants about what use is and, 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 um, and certainly you know, ensuring that the mark is in use on all of the goods and services in uh, maintenance filing or in an application before it's filed. Bob, are you still uh, connecting? I'm back. Tom's check, am I? In oh, that's better. Yes. Okay. okay, great. Yep, you're good. All right. Um, anything you want to say on that? Yeah, I, I think, and I don't know if you touched on it, but, you know, under the rules of professional conduct, uh, attorneys practicing before us have certain uh, duties as to due diligence and reasonable investigation um, and confirming use of of the, the goods and services. So, again, and I think you alluded to this, OED would be looking into that if, if, if they think there might be um, some violation of those rules. Yep. Um, okay, where should we as practitioners report the fraudulent solicitations our clients received? Uh, is there any way to track what happens to a fraudulent solici solicitation after it's reported to the USPTO? Um, okay, so two different issues here. Um, we are collecting reports from customers, including practitioners, of uh, examples of solicitations uh, that customers are getting that, that are considered to be misleading by the customer. We will post those examples on our website. Uh, if we already have an example, then we're not going to post your example, but we certainly will do that. So send those to tmscams at uspto.gov. Repeat, tmscams at uspto.gov. Okay, so what are we doing with those fraudulent solicitations? Okay. We are not a law enforcement agency. We do not have a mandate to investigate criminal behavior or, or these solicitations or to figure out whether um, a, a particular solicitation has crossed the line. Um, we only can deal with the, you know, to the, effect, to, it, to the extent that an application is at issue or a registration is at issue. That's what's before us. Uh, and so that's what we can, we can work on. Now, that said, we're not powerless here. We are posting these things on our website. We are, you know, you know, highlighting these for law enforcement, um, and certainly we're trying to make folks aware uh, of the, that these solicitations are out there. You can go on our website and see all the information that we've provided. Um, it's a scourge, and it's it's happening globally. These are global schemes to to mislead um, folks uh, uh, as to what they need to do. They have to get on some sort of global database and, and pay an enormous fee to get on that. No, you don't need to do that. So we, we want to make sure that our customers are aware that these are not necessary. You, you really don't need to pay these fees, um, and we're trying to do that. But we have limited resources, and, and um, we don't have the, the mission or the mandate to actually you know go after what, what appears to be criminal fraud or mail fraud, and as you saw in the case of the the Horikoff case. So we do uh, refer these issues to law enforcement uh, to look into. So to the extent that it's, it's a large scheme, like you saw with the Horikoff case, uh, we work with law enforcement to provide whatever information we can uh, to make sure that they have what they need to go forward with the prosecution, and you can see that it was successful. We would love to see more of these. Uh, and so we are having those conversations where we can. Um, but internally, if the application isn't before us that's at issue, there's limited uh, you know, things that we can do on that. Anything you want to add on that, Bob? No, that covers it. Okie dokie. Okay. Let's see. Pardon me while I read this very long question. I apologize. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, there's a, uh, I think it's a question, but I'm not sure. Have you fixed or will you fix the glitch where examiners cannot tell when the filer of the change of domicile address clicks the checkbox to keep the address private? Um, and there's a whole lot of information here. Wait, it just moved. I, I checked with a couple. I saw that okay. uh, question. I checked with a couple subject matter experts on it. There, there shouldn't be a glitch. There might have been some confusion when we implemented that new mask domicile procedure. So it, it may have been an awareness issue on, on behalf of the examining attorneys. Um, so if it's hidden from view publicly, the examining attorney should still be able to see it in their internal systems in the file wrapper. So there, there should be no glitch, but to the extent um, the, the questioner 
wants to follow up on that, we'll, we'll um, reach out to you through the email we received. Yep, okay. If a trademark owner uses an outside law firm but wants to receive correspondence copy from the USPTO on its matters, will the trademark owner be required to have a USPTO.gov account? So the question is, Bob, tell me if I'm wrong, is the question is, is can the trademark owner be, have a correspondence email address in the record? And if they have that, do they have to have a USPTO.gov account? Under I under our current so. plans, yeah, under our current plans, if it's a CC address, they they can receive correspondence. The my USPTO account and ID verification are for access to forms and records. Um, so, as we're you know planning now, there there's no requirement for that CC address to also have a my USPTO.gov um, account. But again, we are currently planning how all that's going to go, so no commitments on that one. Right. But if the attorney representation or recognition ended uh, and the trademark owner wanted to file a TEAS document, a maintenance document or something like that, yes, you would have to have a USPTO.gov account at that point. Uh, but if you're represented, you don't have to. But I suspect the questioner knows that. Um, is the letter of protest to be used for post-registration challenge? No, we addressed that. Okay. Um, Okay. Is the new identity, this is about login phase two. Uh, is the new identity protection program, it's identity protection, <laughs> identity verification program going to require social security numbers? Yes. Um, many of us are very careful to protect our social security numbers given a rampant identity theft. Agreed. Um, and certainly you will be hearing more and more about login phase two identity verification uh, as we move forward. Certainly aware of the social security number concern. Um, that is why we're partnering with ID.me. It is a, a vendor that has um, many programs with uh, government agencies, IRS, Social Security, um, and you know, the Veterans Affairs, I think. Um, and they, we do not hold the data. They hold the data. Um, and you can actually have it after it's been used to verify your account. Uh, you can actually have the data purged um, and it, they will not hold it anymore. So um, I'm not the expert in this. Uh, this is just part of our register protection initiatives, and I wanted to go through those those slowly today. But I think as you go forward, um, as we move forward with phase two, you'll be hearing more and more information about this, uh, and you will certainly have the opportunity to let us know uh, what you think uh, when you we, you know hear more about how IDME is going to uh, protect the the PII that they that they collect uh, and hold, uh, and then you know eventually purge um, uh, uh, if you choose that. So. Stay tuned on login phase two. We're at early stages now. Would the office consider a trademark registration bar exam like the PAT bar to control combat, to combat bad actors and unet? Yes. <laughs> no, um, not yet. Uh, it would require a statutory change um, to section five of the Administrative Procedures Act. No, it, it needs, we would need a statute change. Uh, so to the extent we wanted to move forward with creating a trademark bar, uh, like the patent side has, you'll hear about it um, because it would require Congress to uh, to intervene. But if more and more people are interested in that, we'd like to hear more about it. Um, uh, if there's a lot of support for that, certainly it seems like it would be very helpful to regulate attorney conduct before us, or misconduct, I should say. Uh, and uh, it's something I'm paying attention to. So if you all are interested, uh, let us know. All right. Oh, I... I think Allison Ricketts must be on the, on the line. Uh, will notice pleading be the standard for instituting a new Section 14 cancellation proceeding on the basis that the mark has never been used on some or all of the goods and services? In other words, does this proceeding, I guess that's an expungement proceeding before the board, require documentary evidence of non-use or is that evidence required only for the petition to the commissioner procedure? Uh, and let's see. The answer is it depends, um, and I will plead a lot of ignorance to this. So uh, we might have to have a conversation offline with the person who asked the question. Um, uh, let's see, pleading at the board is always subject to the governing principles for notice pleading. Um, that said, we certainly have some claims that require more facts to be alleged to constitute sufficient notice pleading. 
Uh, for example, pleading dilution and fraud claims require some specificity. Uh, this is really a matter of first impression, so I don't think we're going to be able to answer that right now. Um, but I think a further follow-up conversation with the questioner, uh, we're, we're happy to, to do that with uh, somebody who's a lot more qualified than I am to, to speak to that issue. Maybe Bob is, but I, <laughs> I don't know. No, I was going to suggest that we want to consult the TTAB on that one. Yep, I think that's right. Uh, when are these new procedures for expungement and reexamination available? December, late December. Look for them. Uh, you'll certainly hear about it. Uh, we'll be, I will be uh, very excited to get these launched uh, and ready for you all to use. So at the end of this year, you should be uh, uh, looking to file one of those petitions or file uh, an expungement proceeding before the board. Let's see. Uh, using Section 7, to, the Section 7 amendment procedure to delete goods are encouraged. Yes, I'm encouraging you to use that. Uh, but I filed one in February to correct a typo in the owner's name, and I still have not received any news of acceptance. How fast do you anticipate Section 7 for deletions to be processed in the future? Uh, that's a good question. And I will say, I can't really answer that right right now, but I expect them to be <laughs> processed very quickly. Um, now, whether that, that can happen uh, based on workload, we'll have to see. But I will say that if a Section 7 amendment is filed during an expungement or reexamination proceeding, we're going to move on that really fast because that will obviously moot the proceeding and we want that to happen. So those will more than likely go to the front of the line in order to make sure that we get uh, the expungement and reexamination proceeding over as quickly as possible if, if the Section 7 would moot it. Uh, so we certainly are looking at that. And I am sorry that it's taking so long uh, on the Section 7, but uh, we are we're working on that. Yeah, but regular post regular post registration um, review of Section Sevens are at about four months pendency right now. So February should have been reviewed by now. So we might need to follow up with that that questioner to get some more facts. Yeah, so we, we can, can do that. Resolve that. Craig has the email, so we can do that. Yep. Okay. Uh, can you elaborate on the role that the task force has when coordinating with Department of Justice? Is there an ongoing role after matters are referred to DOJ, or is it a clean pass off? Hmm. A um, little bit of both. Um, generally, if it goes to OED or it goes to Department of Justice, uh, we don't hear anything. Um, OED is confidential, so we really don't hear anything. Uh, DOJ, if they need something from us, if they need more information, uh, we are asked to provide it, but we're not asked why, um, when we can't really ask any questions. So it's uh, if they need more from us, we give it, uh, but they're not sharing the, they're not sharing their investigation with us for the most part. Is that fair, Bob? Yeah. Okay. If we see an owner address that appears to be a mail drop, can we pass that information along via TM feedback, or is it necessary to file a letter of protest? Um, you know what? I, you know, I think we are now running a program that's going to catch those. Uh, we are, are running all addresses against the USPS uh, database, um, and it identifies which are mail drops and, and commercial mail receiving agencies. So, um, I, you know, we should catch it. Uh, we will put a, a note in the file for the examiner to take an action on that, and they can't move the application forward until they do. Uh, so the examiner will catch that. Uh, so I, I think it would be a redundancy if you all to, were to provide us that information as well. Um, if it's really bothering you, send it to tmscams at uspto.gov, and, and we'll take a look. Uh, but again, I think it's probably, I think we're, we're covered because we've automated that procedure. ID verification. How will the, oh, another hard question that I, <laughs> wow, okay. Um, how will this work if a filer is the secretary? Often the secretary prepares the filing for execution by attorney or client. Um, perhaps I'm not entirely understanding this new implementation. You and me both. Okay. So this is phase three of login. We're not there yet. Uh, that is going to be a ways out. Um, so hold on. And, and uh, certainly, you know, we're, we're, we're good about uh, putting out uh, communications on these things as we roll out these initiatives. 
we are planning on doing a webinar much like this one uh, next summer uh, on login and on phase two and whatever phase we're at at that point. And if we have more information about phase three, we will share it. Uh, so, you know, at this stage, it's premature for us to, to um, share that information because um, we don't have it all figured out yet, uh, but we're certainly working on it and we'll share that with you in the, in the webinar. Hopefully it's not going to be me telling you about it. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be somebody who's actually administering that process. Um, although if you really want me, I can come back, but <laughs> don't really have to do that. Okay. Uh, somebody else is asking about Section 7. Uh, I think we answered that question. Yes, we're looking to shorten shorten the processing time if a Section 7 is filed. Uh, certainly, we you know, if, if we're encouraging you to use that process in order to delete goods and services so that you don't get caught up in uh, an expungement reexamination, then we darn well need to to move those forward faster. So we will we will definitely look to do that. Thank you for the question. Uh, for the order to show cause sanctions, what is the USPTO timeline in issuing a resolution? Um, uh, okay, I guess I can share this. The reason for the question is that there there is a trademark application that my client wants to oppose, and the application has been withdrawn from publication. We are currently monitoring the status of this application. Perhaps an explanation of the USPTO process in analyzing the order to show cause and reviewing the responses would be helpful, and how transparent is the process? Okay. Um, we okay. <laughs> we are working on it. <laughs> we are developing the processes um, that we need. We are garnering the resources that we need to move forward more quickly with investigations, um, with show cause orders, and with final orders. We would love to be ready to go and issue all these things all at once and move these things through so that you can get stuff that you're watching off the register. Uh, we are doing the best we can. Uh, to try to move this new process forward as quickly as we can. Um, we're working on website content. We're trying to make it more transparent. Uh, but certainly because this is an investigation, there's not a whole lot we can share. We are looking to, to uh, implement various uh, prosecution history entries in TSDR that would reflect what is happening to an application. If it's just sitting there and it's not moving, um, we, we're, we're going to put prosecution history entries in there indicating that it's been suspended, uh, pending an administrative decision on the investigation, if it's been, you know, um, if a show cause order has been issued, that sort of thing. So we're we're trying to create some more transparency in the in the system. Um, but as you know, any IT change is very difficult, um, and uh, so we're certainly trying to to do that and create that transparency for you uh, in in the process. As for timing, it's a matter of resources. So if we are undertaking an investigation and we have um, thousands of applications that we are in, you know, holding and investigating uh, and, and trying to move forward into either a show cause order or release them back into examination. Uh, so you can appreciate with uh, limited uh, resources that we have that we're working on building up, uh, that we're, we're moving as fast as we can, but it is, it is difficult to make sure we have everything in place um, to be able to move these through quickly and make sure that any affected applicants have the information that they need um, uh, after a uh, final order has been issued uh, on a particular uh, application or, or group of applications. So apologize that we can't give you more information. Um, watch our website, watch TSCR entries to see what's going on there. And as we can move forward with these, these changes to, to make the proceedings more, more transparent, we, we will do that. Um, so apologies for that. But um, uh, we are certainly under, under uh, developing. We are, we are certainly working on developing everything. Uh, will the owner domicile addresses and the applicant's email address stay masked? This is in cases where a client runs an online business from home and maintains a P.O. box for their mailing address. Um, if it's masked now, it will stay masked, I think. Is that fair? I'm not sure I fully understand the question why it would come unmasked, but okay. Um, can you explain what the identity verification phase for USPTO.gov accounts will entail? Um, went through that briefly. I'm sorry, I had a slide that I had to rush through. Uh, again, when um, when we're ready to roll these things out, because right again, we're in beta testing, 
and then we will start making uh, the it optional for folks to use the, the USPTO account of identity verification, and then eventually we will make it uh, mandatory. Um, and so as we move through these processes, you'll hear more and more information about what we're offering. Um, but essentially, it is uh, ID me. If you go to their website, you can see what the the, uh, the process is, and we will be providing more information. Would the USPTO consider offering a service of giving an advanced thumbs up or down on specimens before the registrant files the declaration of use? Um, wow, uh, an advisory opinion. I'm not sure. I think uh, I think that the answer to that is to. I think they mean the SOU, right? The SOU stage, Bob, or would you say that's the application stage? I guess it could be either if they're talking about a specimen of use, but you know, typically we don't provide an advisory opinion. Right. Uh, if you file your SOU early on in the the you know maintenance time frame, and then you get a you know you can come back and and fix whatever problems are there. So file early. And that. Um, lastly, I, I see Jason's coming on. Uh, who do we contact when we suspect an attorney is running a filing mill? Um, oh, file a grievance, oed at uspto.gov. Uh, and you can also um, file, send something to tmscams at uspto.gov. You may not get a response, but it will go into, um, you know, into the queue and we'll, we'll be able to take a look at it. All right, well, we are at 4.30, uh, so it's up to you, Amy, if you want to try and uh, knock out some of these that are here. Otherwise, we can try and uh, handle them via email. Uh, these are pretty, pretty detailed ones. Um, uh, I don't think we have, oh, wow, they <laughs> keep coming. <laughs> um, no, I don't think we're going to be able to handle all those right now. Okay. Great. Uh, well, so we'll have to follow up. Great. Well, that sounds good. All right, folks. Well, we're, we we got to shut it down then. Uh, but if you did send in one of those questions, especially one of those detailed questions, we will get you a response. Uh, as we close out today, just a couple of quick reminders. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for being here to, uh, today. We really appreciate it uh, when folks uh, show up for these types of things and ask the really great questions that all of you ask. Um, so just to let you know, you should be getting uh, an email from Eventbrite very, very soon if you didn't receive one already, uh, which has a link to a very short survey literally will take you one to two minutes to fill out and we would encourage you to do that we really do um, want to know what you think and if there are things that we can do better what you liked or if there are uh, suggestions you have for things that uh, we could um, maybe talk about in in future webinars uh, and just a, just a reminder, if those of you who found us through Eventbrite, uh, you can always go to our website, uspto.gov, and there's lots of great information there. And we also have various events that are always happening um, all across the USPTO that cover not just trademarks, but also patents as well. Uh, so if you have any interest in those things, be sure to go to our events page on uspto.gov and sign up. So thank you very much, folks, for uh, tuning in today. And as we said before, uh, we should have this recording posted in about three to four weeks. Uh, and if you are someone who wants uh, CLE credit and uh, you are somebody who uh, signed in today uh, using your email address uh, into the live stream, uh, then you, that will count as a verified attendance and we will be sending you information so you can claim your CLE credit. So thank you very much to Amy and Bob. And thank you very much, folks, for tuning in today. Take care. We'll see you next time.